7.59 a.m. Sup, though. Last winter, my brother and I went to a small cabin owned by our uncle in the mountain valley. We drove for three hours to reach the place. The area was so stranded that the closest hotel was 70 kilometers away, but we were young and wanted to stay close to nature. My brother and I are both trained skiers, so upon reaching, all we wanted to do was go skiing in the thick white snow. We honked our horns and got down of the car. A teenage boy, about 15 to 16 years old, came out running from the cabin. He was very young and had a smile on his face. His eyes looked sleepy though, like he was tired. He took our luggage and showed us the way in. Or, you know, maybe he not tired. Maybe he hopped, you know, hyped up on some shit. You know what I mean? Maybe he got a bad case of Gator, Gator voice, whatever that is. My brother and I entered the cabin. It was a small common cabin in the woods. There was a fireplace in the room and in the corner was wood piled up for it. It gets really cold at night, the boy said in a calm voice. My brother told him that we were going skiing, so it would be good if he could prepare dinner for us. The boy smiled and nodded his head. We got dressed in our skiing clothes, took our equipment, and started gliding down the woods. All the trees were bare, robbed straight out of their leaves. The white snow was sparkling as the sun's rays fell on them. We were going slow because the wind was really cold, and we were halfway in the woods when the snowfall began. Let's take a break, then we'll head back, I said to my brother. He agreed and we grabbed our skis and poles and started walking to this big tree buried in snow. Suddenly, we heard a sound, almost like a small grunt, and we stopped. Next to that tree stood a man. Jesus. If you heard... Why the hell would you stop dead in your tracks? He was looking up at the sky. The snowflakes were falling on his face. We could only see his long neck and pointy shoulders. He didn't move. I looked at my brother. Both of us were feeling a little freaked out. The man was behaving so weirdly. I gestured to my brother to slowly step back without disturbing him and go back to our cabins fast. We took three steps back when I accidentally stepped on a twig. It crunched and the man looked down at us. That twig, that twig was in the hoops. I just want to let you know that because that twig wasn't there at first. But when you step back, you know what I mean? That twig said, let me go ahead and just. I see, I see, I see the situation going on right now. I see the situation going on right now. So I'm just, you know what I mean? Let me just. Let me just throw that twig in the mix. You know what I mean? See, 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 see how, see how it goes out. See how it plans out. Let me see. Oh, go ahead. His eyes were glowing like a wolf. There was blood smeared all over his mouth. That's when, for the first time, I noticed his right hand. He was clenching a dead rabbit. Its stomach was ripped open and its entrails hanging out. The man wiped the blood off his face with his other hand and he smiled ear to ear. I heard my brother scream. Stefan, now! Run! 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 I started running. This is a true story. That shit crazy. My brother was behind me. We didn't see if the man followed us. Breathing and panting like a dog, we came back to the cabin. We slammed the door and double locked it. The teenage boy- Double locked it? You should have triple locked it, quadruple locked it, Adidas locked it. And everything that can be locked, should be locked. 
in this cluck ass of a house. Realized something was wrong. He came out of the kitchen and I yelled, Call the cops now! Why? What happened, sir? Stefan, there's no network in my phone. I checked my phone as well. My brother was right. The lines are dead here, sir. It's the snow. The boy replied in a calm voice. Okay. Did anything happen, sir? He asked. I was going to tell him, but then my brother stopped me. He thought the boy will get scared and leave us there. So. Or. The boy can be in the hoops. Just saying. I'm hungry as shit. We told him we heard a wild animal in the woods. He kept cooking quietly. After half an hour, when we have calmed down, we felt embarrassed. So we stopped thinking about the man and went to our rooms to freshen up. A few minutes later, when we came out for dinner, suddenly the light went off. See? A heavy snowstorm had started outside. I could hear the glass windows trembling with the mad wind. Hello? Where are you? What was his name? We never asked his name. My brother and I were looking for the teenage boy when suddenly we heard footsteps. Someone was outside our cabin. My brother and I slowly turned our heads towards the big window right beside the fireplace and the lights hit. The man we saw in those woods was outside our living room window, resting his bloody palm on the glass and planting his face on it in a distorted way while staring dead at us. He slowly opened his mouth and started licking the blood smeared around his red tongue. His eyes never blinked, pupils never moved. My voice died down my throat. I was stiff as ice. Paul. That's when the boy walked in like he was hiding there all this time. Any problem, sir? He... it's him. He's the one we saw in the woods. Oh, him? The boy casually walked to the window put his hand on the glass like he adored this freak and looked back at us. His face got the same grin this man gave us the first time. He's my dad. There's nothing wrong with him. What? He sure, you don't need to be scared of him. He's harmless once he is done eating. I grabbed the car keys from the wall and pulled my brother's hand and opened the door to run out to our car. We didn't care that we were barefoot. We didn't bother that we had no warm clothes on just in our night pajamas, because all we wanted was to live. We heard the boy laughing and screaming. There's nothing wrong with him. He just loves to hunt for his food. <laughs> the engine rumbled and we got back to the road. Our luggage was inside, but that was no time to go back for them. We drove for about two hours and found the next hotel. The snowstorm made it excessively risky to drive. But there was no way we were staying with this psycho father-son duo. Once we reached safety, we called our uncle to inform him about this caretaker boy and his father. What my uncle said gave me chills. No caretaker or third-party employee ever worked on that property. Wow. The keys are always under the porch rug. The fact that we stayed with a stranger who appeared like nothing but psychos made me sweat in terror. I gave the phone to my brother because I had had enough for the night. He explained everything that had happened in the cabin and informed him about this boy and his father. He called the cops and the next morning we went to the cabin with them. No one was there. Our luggage was gone. Most likely they took them. We had no money, no clothes, and not even our shoes. The place was swept clean. We called our dad, and he came the second day to pick us up from that motel, and also pay the bills. I still remember that incident with dread. God knows what would have happened if they had any weapons. Since then, I have decided that I will never stay in any stranded cabin for my entire life. Hey guys, I hope you are enjoying the video. If so, please leave a like. And also, a small percentage of people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. If you want to support this channel and make this channel reach the 1 million mark, please consider subscribing. It's free and you can change your mind later. Enjoy. How many times are you going to show that number? I don't know who might be on the other end of this, 
But if you're listening to this message, then I might already be dead. I know. Oh. I know. You think I'm being too dramatic. I don't know. But I promise you, I'm really not. Something seriously messed up is going on here. Something dark and twisted. And now that I've found out, I don't think they'll let me get out of here alive. I can hear them outside, hunting for me. It's so dark. I'm hiding in a closet, and I don't know how much time I have left, so... <sighs> okay, deep breaths. Deep breaths. I must sound freaking crazy to you. And maybe I am, but I'd like you to hear me out, okay? Please, just hear me out. My name is Abigail Walters. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a senior at William Davis High, and... <sighs> you know what? That isn't important. No. What's important is... how loud you're being right now. Talking. Breathing. Moving. You don't want to. You're going to get caught. You're going to die. You're going to die, and I'm not going to care. Not one bit. I don't have time to go into all the details. I'll try, but I think I should focus on telling you how I got here. The winter break just rolled around and school is out for the next few weeks. Everyone was excited. You're saying, you're saying, you, you about to, you about to tell a whole story in a closet. And you're, you're, what's it? You're being hunted? Not hunted. What's it called? What's it? You're being not. Wow. Chase? No. You about to be taken or what's the clocked up? I don't. Oh, you got people. <laughs> You got people looking for you right now and you're trying to stay quiet but you telling the story at the same time. A whole story. That's crazy. I mean, who isn't excited about Christmas? The lights, the snow, Mariah Carey. What? The holidays were set to go great. That was very specific. Until last week. You see, I live alone with my mom. Always have, for as long as I can remember. My father was just some drunk who ran away a couple of years after I was born. Jesus. It's just been me and my mom since then. And we've always spent Christmas together. This year, though, it was different. Mom got a fancy new job at some insurance company in town a few months ago. And the company called her up to attend a two-week conference out of town over the holidays. Damn. She was flown out across the country, leaving me all alone at home for Christmas. She had wanted me to tag along with her, but attending a corporate conference halfway across the country sounded even more dreary than spending the holiday alone. So, I told her I'd stay. Why on earth did I tell her that? If only I hadn't... <sighs> it's no use crying. Tears won't Shut save me. Up. I've got to stay strong. Okay. Deep breaths. <sighs> so, before Mom left, Caroline Baker came over for dinner at our place. Caroline is... Well, I don't know who Caroline is anymore. She... She used to be my best friend. We met in freshman year, and we've been super tight ever since. She'd spend every winter with her family in the woods. Her parents liked to hunt. She said it was a family tradition, something they'd been doing for ages, apparently. They built a nice little cottage in the woods where they'd camp out for about a week before driving back to town when Christmas was over. This time, Caroline offered to take me along. It was a no-brainer. With Mom being gone and Caroline offering, it was the only logical course of action for me to take. A fun Christmas in the woods with my best friend and her family. What could go wrong? We've been searching the house for almost an hour now, Dad. Where is she? Patience, love. She's still in here. What? I'm sure of that. Oh, Maybe yo, I'm did he just sniff? She's in here. She's in here. She's definitely... Yeah, she's in here. What? Staken? Picking up an old scent or something? 
No, it's her. You don't forget the smell of young blood. Oh, it's God. different. Richer. Trust me, she's close. All right, then. But I'll be damned if I spend another 30 minutes searching for her when there's stew getting cold in the kitchen. We can always warm the stew back up. Not a big deal. But this? Come on. No use standing around. Let's keep looking. I knew, I knew, I knew it was like when she said hunting, like her pants hunting, but they, but she didn't specify what they hunted. Yeah. Oh. Oh. You just swallow your thumb? Whew. You just swallow your thumb? That was close. Too close, if I'm being honest. You just swallowed I your... left home on the night of the 21st. Caroline came to pick me up. We hung out at her house for a couple of hours before her parents got back from work. They were so happy to see me. Looking back now, it felt a bit unnatural. Their excitement was so out of place. Parents don't usually get that excited when their kids' friends come over. But then again, it had been quite a while since I went over to Caroline's place, and so I thought... <sighs> I don't know what I thought. I remember Mrs. Baker sniffing my hair when she hugged me. And I couldn't be sure at the time, but now I'm pretty sure I heard Mr. Baker's stomach rumble. Like he was hungry or something. I should have known something was wrong back then. I should have made up some excuse right then and bolted out their front door. But no, I stayed. On the morning of the 22nd, Mr. Baker informed us that we'd be driving up to their cabin in the woods. Caroline had told me once that usually they left town on Christmas Eve. That was the second red flag. We were leaving three days early, and it was frantic, almost desperate. When I asked Caroline about the change, she simply told me that plans had changed. What plans, I had no idea, but I tagged along regardless. This was my best friend. I had nothing to fear. I remember pulling up into the dirt track that led to the cabin and seeing it for the first time. It stood at the end of the narrow road, its dark windows like gaping sores on a corpse. Nice. I remember our conversation on the way to the house. Real quiet, isn't it? Yeah, that's why we love it. <laughs> the perfect place for a hunt. At this point, I knew something was definitely wrong. They lit the candles in the cabin and led me to the dinner table. The next thing I felt was a strike to my head by some blunt object. I think it was a candelabra. I didn't really get a good look at it before I passed out. I woke up in the kitchen sometime later, strapped to a creaky wooden table in a dimly lit kitchen. In the dark, I could make out forms of what looked like other humans, strapped to tables like me. None of them were moving. My breath caught in my throat. I tried to wiggle my way out, but the binds would not budge. Mrs. Baker walked into the kitchen, sharpening a pair of butchering knives. Ah... Uh, Little Caroline brought us a good one this year, didn't she? We always wanted a taste of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. How juicy you'll be in the stew. Mrs. Baker, what are you doing? I don't understand. Christmas came early. Y'all yeah, yeah, know that YouTuber... No, Gator. What's the YouTube? Um, I forgot his name. But like he get he has amazing grip, pause. Um, and he can pretty much break anything. You know what I mean? He's light skinned. He can do a Russian pull up like nothing. I don't really know. I don't know his name though. But I feel like if he was if he was her strapped like to that table with the with the with the ropes, I would I felt like he would just been like, all right, let me just go ahead and get out. Uh, perhaps not for you, but when we're done, I'm sure you won't mind one bit. She turned around to inspect a pot of stew with pieces of meat that's, bubbling over a fire. That's nice. I gagged as soon as I realized what was going on. These people were going to eat me. Mrs. Baker went to one of the other tables and began hacking and... I thought, I really thought he did that. I mean, she did that to her. Well, like, well, like while she was alive. 
Lysing. I saw an opportunity in her absence. One leg of the table I was tied to was shaky, creaking in protest as I struggled. Luckily, as I was next to a wall, I managed to gently rock back and forth until I gathered enough momentum to push myself off of it. The table landed on its side, with me still on it. It splintered with a loud crack, loosening the ropes that bound me. Mrs. Baker turned around when she heard the sound. She screamed like an animal and charged at me with her knives. I reached for the broken leg of the wooden table and swung at her head with all the force I could muster. She folded to the floor, but I didn't wait around to see the extent of the damage. I bolted out of the kitchen and towards the front door. Unfortunately, Carol and her dad were on the front porch. There was no way out. What the hell are they looking at? What the hell are they looking at? <laughs> it sneaked by unnoticed. I had to get out of sight as soon as possible. So I ran upstairs to the attic. It was dark and dusty and quiet, but at least it was safe. I found an old drawer big enough to crawl into and have been here ever since. Thankfully, my phone was still in my jacket pocket. He said you're, you're safe or you feel safe, but that's their house. You don't think they know their house? Inside or not? It has a low battery and there's barely any signal out here, so I don't know what good it'll do. At least I was able to tell this story. Maybe someone, sometime in the future, will find it and hear my story. Or maybe not. It's just past midnight. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm sore. I don't know how much longer I can hold out here. It's been a little over an hour and they haven't found me yet. Maybe they think I managed to run away. Nice. Which is a good thing, I guess. But how on earth am I going to get out of here without being seen? Look at all of those windows. Look at all of those windows. You see? Out the window, like... I'm pretty sure they know where you are. And they just playing with you. That's, that's how I, yeah. Hey guys, my name is Robert. Maybe everyone who knows me around here knows that I'm just another local doctor, but I used to work in the big city. When everyone knows that I worked in such a central and populated place, they all ask me, how can I go back to a small town since the pay is less and the days are more boring? My answer is just simple. I did not come in search of tranquility, nor to be close to my family. I only came out of fear. Fear that those people who tried to kill me in the most cruel and ruthless way possible do not find out that I am still alive and come to finish the job. It all started when I was just a nurse. I had just graduated from university and was one of those young aspiring doctors who would give everything for a chance to prove themselves. Oh, yeah. The dream of every newcomer was to save a person's life in a major surgery. But all this doesn't happen until you have more experience. At this point, I was just inspecting medications or taking care of patients in intensive care. Make no mistake, I was happy with this. I knew it was part of the natural progression to being a great doctor, so I did my job to the best of my ability. Someone had to. One day, I was taking care of a patient. I was looking for the medicine to give him, but I noticed that there was no more left. So I had to go to the warehouse to get a new bottle. When I got there, I grabbed the small bottle of liquid and was about to go back, but I noticed something strange. Out of curiosity, I read the bottle and noticed that this medicine had expired more than five years ago. What? It can't be. I grabbed more bottles to inspect them, and they all shared the same oddity. All of them had already expired many years ago. This had to be a mistake. I went to the director's room to inform him of this. Maybe it was a problem with the inventory. I knocked on the door, and from inside, a hurried voice was dispatched. What do you want, Robert? It's not the best moment. Dr. Cole, there's an irregularity with a medication I'd like to show you. Not now, kid. I'm too busy. And he simply left. I was about to go back and ask a doctor what to do, but Dr. Cole's behavior made me very curious. He has always had a calm, relaxed, and charismatic demeanor. Besides, not now, kid. The doctor always treats me very well, and several times he expressed to me that I am one of his favorite nurses. He would never treat me that way. Okay. Was there something wrong with him? Yes. Maybe he had a serious problem, and I could help him. 
Without him seeing me, I followed him to the parking lot and from there to the back exit door. Dr. Cole walked a few more yards to a darker area, an area where I knew some doctors went to smoke during their breaks, but since it was snowing, no one went during this time of year. When he arrived, someone was waiting for the doctor. A strange, tall, muscular man with a mostly covered body seemed to be waiting for him. When the doctor arrived, the man took off his hat and revealed his face. Ashton, so nice to see ya. You're getting later and later. Are you fooling around with a nurse? It's getting harder and harder to get out, yo. I'm afraid they're keeping a much closer eye on me. They might notice. Did you bring the money? Did you get the drugs? When have I failed you? Joe? I know this man. I saw him on the news recently. This man is a dangerous mobster with an arrest warrant. What business could he have with Dr. Cole? In my head, I was putting things together, but when I saw the drugs, I understood everything. Hey, Joe. I got another complaint from some nurse today. He got his hands on your merchandise. I need you to take the job seriously next time and alter the date. You know how long that's gonna take, right? Do it, or it's over for us. We're being discovered. <laughs> I say when it's over. Do you understand? Sir, look! He's a very curious little animal. Suddenly, a new voice sounded from behind me. My blood froze and my body was paralyzed. They were talking about me. Both men looked in my direction, and I turned around and saw him. Oh, great. Bring him here. Before I could react and start running, the huge man hit my belly with an extremely strong blow, and I fell down without air, dizzy. By the hair, the man pulled me to the mobster and threw me close to him. Robert? Do you know him? He's a new nurse, has lots of energy and asks too many questions. I'm sure he wants to save the world. Oh, that's so sweet. What were you listening to? Did the wind bring you here, butterfly? I don't know who you are. I just wanted to smoke a cigarette. You sure couldn't find the pack, could ya? I seen you listening for a long time. Is that so? Doctor, what should we do with the child? Don't ask me that question. You're the Mafia boss. Do what you do best. Indeed. I guess I am the bad guy, right? Please, don't kill me. I won't say anything. Oh, that changes everything. Did you hear Vinny? He won't say anything. <laughs> That's a relief, boss. Joe, can you hurry up? People will start asking questions if we're late. <laughs> wow, the doctor doesn't like you, kid. Vinny, get the shovels out. We'll make a snowman. Not understanding what was going on, I watched as the man started digging a hole in the snow while the mobster kicked me all over the body. Crying, I could not react. I could only see the doctor staring at me helplessly as he smoked a cigarette. His gaze pierced my eyes, and that was all I could see. I felt pain, but what hurt me the most was that sideways look watching my life being extinguished. After a few minutes, my body was so wounded that I couldn't move. The mobster seemed to know this, so he just kicked my body into the snow hole. Laughing and joking, my body began to fill with more and more snow as the man put the snow back in the hole. Minutes passed and everyone was gone. I tried to escape, but I couldn't move. My body was both sore and numb. I was trapped in a coffin of snow, feeling like I was slowly freezing to death. I could no longer breathe, and the snow felt like a gallant fire burning me slowly. At that moment, nothing else made sense. I didn't have to go and complain about the expired medication. I didn't have to follow the doctor. I didn't have to do anything. What was the point of doing the right thing? No one was doing right by me. No one was coming to save me. It was all pain. My eyes slowly closed and I began to see a light. Was I dying? No, that was the light of the sun. As my eyes closed from the brightness of the sun, I saw a familiar face ahead of me. That man was a homeless person whom we let stay in the hospital. 
Was he hiding, watching everything, waiting to save me? I couldn't ask myself any more questions. I just fell asleep. And when I woke up, I was in a hospital ward I didn't know about. I was approached by a co-worker who was in plain clothes, and that's when it hit me. This was not the hospital where I work. The man who rescued me had told him everything. They both thought it was a lie in case Cole asked them, but that never happened. He never asked about me, as I never even existed. When I recovered, I went back to my hometown to live a quiet life. Maybe someday I will denounce Mr. Cole, but even though I know I will be judged, I don't dare to do it for now. I want to enjoy my family and friends. I don't want to die. You know, Macklemore got a song called Drug Dealer, I think. It go, and of course, go like, a drug dealer is a doctor, doctor, something like that. That's crazy how some of the most people that you're supposed to trust be the ones that you would least expect. Police officers, teachers, doctors, presidents, you know, your co-workers, like, these are the people that we're supposed to trust, but sometimes they be the ones that you least expect to do the most damage. That shit crazy. I wonder whatever happened to that doctor. You mean, it says it's a true story, so I wonder whatever happened to that doctor. The second story, you missing on that. You, there's some, like, there's some, like, alternate get out type shit. As soon as the girl said, my parents, like, hunted, and but she didn't specify what they hunted, I would have been out of it. Yeah, you got all that. Keep it cool, keep it classy, and I love you, stay happy, my family. Thank you.